In his new film, The Revenant, Leonardo DiCaprio plays Hugh Glass, an explorer in the 1800s. Glass endures sub-zero temperatures, a vicious bear attack, and in his quest for revenge against a fellow explorer. In August of 1823, Hugh Glass was attacked by a grizzly bear and left to die. Glass survived, and his story has captured people's attention for two centuries. The ability of life to keep pushing forward against all adversity is amazing. It's a story that has been told and retold for two centuries. The 2015 movie The Revenant brought Hugh Glass's name into the minds of millions of people. The Hollywood version, of course, is filled with dramatic scenes that never happened and characters who didn't exist. What we know about the early life of Hugh Glass is very little. No records exist, but it is believed he was born in Pennsylvania and he was the son of Irish immigrants. Stories state that in 1816, Glass was captured by a famous Gulf of Mexico pirate, Jean Lafitte, off the coast of Texas. He was given the choice to either join the pirate's gang or to die. Glass chose, mm, life, and he chose to join the gang of pirates. He stayed on Galveston Island with the other pirates for a year to two years. He allegedly escaped by swimming ashore to present-day Galveston, Texas with another deserter. Glass and his other escapee made their way 1,000 miles into Indian territory. Stories state that Glass was captured by Pawnee Indians, a group that gave human sacrifices to their gods for fertile land. Glass watched his friend burn alive at the stake. Stories state Glass was to be killed next. The chief came up to him, and Glass pulled out a package of vermilion. The chief took this as a sign from God to let him live. He was adopted by the Pawnee and even took a Native American wife. In 1821, Glass traveled to St. Louis, Missouri with Pawnee delegates who were invited there by U.S. officials. Beaver was in high demand in the 1820s. Hat makers used beaver fur to make their felt hats all over the world. The trappers mainly were in search of beaver, most of all their fur, traveling hundreds of miles away from the nearest American settlement for months or even years at a time. In 1822, General William Henry Ashley placed an advertisement in the Missouri Gazette calling for a corps of a hundred men to join a fur trading venture seeking enterprising young men to ascend the Missouri River as hunters. Many famous mountain men got their start with the expedition, but others had experience in fur trading already. Some of the hundred men included James Beckworth, David Jackson, William Sublet, Jim Bridger, John Fitzgerald, James Kleiman, and Jedediah Smith. The men on this expedition were known as Ashley's Hundred. Hugh Glass did not join General Ashley's expedition in 1822, but he joined it in 1823 as a hunter, and he traveled the Missouri River with General Ashley on a resupply trip. Using keelboats, they, along with the other newly hired men, had to pole the bottom to propel their boats, as well as haul them. Occasionally, they were able to sail. The boats were 40 to 60 feet long, they were going against the strong Missouri current. They traveled 10 to 15 miles a day, headed for Fort Henry, also known as Henry's Fort. The fort was around 2,000 river miles from St. Louis. The river, of course, going nowhere near in a straight line. Jedediah Smith met the boats heading the opposite direction in a canoe with a note for General Ashley from Andrew Henry. His partner, an Indian raid, had run off the horses at the fort, and they were in desperate need of more. The river after the fort was not suitable for boat traffic. The hunters used horses to travel deep into the wilderness towards the Rockies. Ashley and his men stopped at a re-village and traded for horses. It's reported that Ashley traded 25 muskets and ammunition for 19 horses. He would send one group overland with the horses, around 40 men, including Hugh Glass, and the others to continue upriver. The Urukar Indians in the village, also called Re, warned Ashley that the village's warriors were going to attack the Americans, either at their village or later on in the prairie. Ashley decided to stay where he was and waited out. They were to make camp and secure the horses. 
Accounts of what happened differ, but it is believed that two of the trappers snuck off and headed into the village. They were, um, trying to get lucky with some of the village women, if you know what I mean. In the early morning of June 1st, three warriors snuck onto one of the boats. Ashley scared them away with his pistol. They were trying to get into his room. Around the same time, one of the white men that was in the village ran back to the beach where the expedition was camped, shouting that his companion had been killed. The expedition decided not to flee, but stay there and wait till daylight. Before dawn, one of the re villagers offered to retrieve the body of the fallen man in exchange for the price of a horse. They paid the villager. He left and returned without the body, stating that the body was too damaged to return. Once it was daylight, the men were huddled together on the beach. They could see warriors in the village loading rifles. One of Ashley's men was shot, along with a number of horses. The men used the fallen horses as cover. Ashley ordered the boats to come closer to shore. It took a while, but one of the boats came close, but was grounded on a sandbar. A few of the men escaped into one of the smaller boats, but the oarsman was shot, and the boat drifted away. The re began advancing towards the beach. Expedition members that knew how to swim jumped into the river and headed for the boats. Some of the men drowned. The re warriors made it to the beach. The keel boat that was stuck on the sandbar was freed, and the other boats cut anchor. The boats drifted at a musket range. The attack lasted only 15 minutes. Ashley had 14 men killed and 11 wounded, including Hugh Glass, who was shot in the leg. The drifting boats pulled men out of the water and buried any dead that they recovered. Hugh Glass wrote a letter to the family of one of the fallen men, John Gardner. It reads, Dear Sir, my painful duty is to tell you of the death of your son who befell at the hands of the Indians, 2nd June. In the early morning, he lived a little while after he was shot and asked me to inform you of his sad fate. We brought him to the ship when he soon died. Mr. Smith, a young man of our company, made powerful prayer, which moved us greatly, and I am persuaded John died in peace. His body we buried with others near this camp and marked the grave with a log. His things we will send to you. The savages are greatly treacherous. We trade with them as friends, but after a great storm of rain and thunder, they came at us before light, and many were hurt. I myself was shot in the leg. Mr. Ashley is bound to stay in these parts till the traitors are rightly punished. Hugh Glass most of the trappers wanted revenge on the Ree village. Ashley wanted to sneak past. The trappers won and convinced Ashley to get vengeance on the village. The wounded men were sent back on one of the keel boats to St. Louis, along with any man who wanted to return. Ashley had also written letters to Fort Atkinson, the newspaper in St. Louis, and the Indian agent, asking for reinforcements. Jedediah Smith was sent downriver to get additional men. The rest of the men that were left with Ashley camped down the river from the Indian village and waited for reinforcements. Colonel Henry Leavenworth from Fort Atkinson left with 230 officers and men towards the Ree village. Along the way, Leavenworth acquired 140 more volunteers, along with 500 Lakota horsemen, reaching the village with around 900 men to fight. Hugh Glass was still hurt from being shot in the leg, so he did not join in the revenge mission. They skirmished for a day and a half. Leavenworth eventually called a cease fire. His men were very angry with this decision. The Indians had killed white men and they wanted vengeance upon them. After the Lakota Indians saw the peace talks, they just left with their 500 men. They went home. A treaty was made with the Ree village. Leavenworth claimed victory. The Ree vanished during the night. Leavenworth's army left in the morning, but behind them they saw a cloud of smoke. The others had set fire to the village. After this debacle, Ashley made it to Fort Kiowa and traded for more horses. He split his men into two groups. Andrew Henry would lead one party cross-country to Fort Henry. They would shut down the fort and then make their way south to winter with the Crow people. Hugh Glass was doing better. 
His leg had healed, so he headed out with Henry and the 30 men, or 17, the exact number is uh, disputed, along with six horses in August 1823. The other party was led by Jedediah Smith. They were going directly to the Crow people to winter and get ready for the spring fur hunt in 1824. Ashley returned to St. Louis. He abandoned the Missouri River. It was too dangerous to travel that way. Ashley and Henry decided going overland to the Rockies was the safest way from now on. Henry led his men towards the fort on foot with pack horses in tow. Daniel Potts, a member of the group, stated that there was an Indian attack on the party in late August. He said that the trappers were fired on by the Mandins and Grovant Indians at night, killing two and wounding two. The group's number was now 15, but by early September they had traveled up the Grand River Valley. Hugh Glass was hired as a hunter. This meant that he had to travel ahead of the other fur trappers in order to search for game. He was looking along the brushy river bottom. He spotted a grizzly sow with two cubs. The grizzly charged glass, pick him up, bit, slashed, and lacerated him, severely wounding him, and then held him to the ground. The rest of the fur trappers heard Glass's screams. Ah! Several of them made their way to Glass, and they killed the grizzly bear. Trapper Hiram Allen wrote this about the scene he encountered. The monster had torn the flesh from the lower part of the body and from the lower limbs. He had also had his neck shockingly torn, even to the degree that an aperture appeared to have been made into the windpipe and his breath to exude at the sides of his neck. Blood flowed freely, but fortunately his hands and arms were not disabled. Once the rest of the group saw how severely Glass had been wounded, Henry and most of the veteran trappers were sure that Glass would die before the morning. Glass survived the night. There were bands of hostile Indians in the area. Henry made the decision that they needed to stay on the move. He ordered the men to build a litter so they could carry Glass on it. They carried Glass for two days, but it slowed their pace dramatically. Henry knew that they needed to rejoin with the other group, so he called for two volunteers to stay with Glass until he died and then bury him. John Fitzgerald and a man believed to be named Bridges or Bridger volunteered. It is debated whether or not Bridges was actually the famous mountain man Jim Bridger. The volunteers would receive an $80 bonus. The rest of the group continued on their journey and the two men dug a grave for Glass. Despite his injuries, Glass remained conscious, but he could not speak. The only thing he could do was breathe and move his eyes. Glass stayed alive for five days after the departure of the other trappers. The more experienced trapper, John Fitzgerald, believed they were in extreme danger of being discovered by the hostile Indians. And he convinced the younger Bridger that they had fulfilled their agreement. They had watched over Glass for five days, way longer than anybody believed he would stay alive for. The two men believed the Glass could die at any moment, and they were in fear of their lives. The two men moved Glass next to a flowing spring. They took Glass's rifle, knife, tomahawk, and his fire-making kit, believing no dead man needed these items. They headed for the fort at the mouth of the Yellowstone. Glass awoke and realized that he had been abandoned. His wounds were now festering. He had a broken leg, deep cuts along his back that exposed his ribs. He lay there, mutilated and alone, 200 miles from the nearest American settlement at Fort Kiowa. Glass set the bone in his own leg, wrapped himself in a bear hide, that his two companions had left on him as a shroud. He let maggots eat dead skin from his wounds so they could clean them. He got some strength back in him and managed to crawl back towards the Missouri River. He needed supplies, arms, and equipment if he was going to survive. Thoughts of revenge on his two caretakers that abandoned him also festered in his mind. Travel was painfully slow at first. His only source of nourishment was insects at first. A rattlesnake came close to him one day and he was able to kill it and eat it for nourishment. 
he also survived on any edible plants that he passed. After a week of slow travel, Glass found a pack of wolves in the process of killing a buffalo calf. He hid and waited for the wolves to finish eating their kill. He made off with half of the buffalo calf during the night. He camped for a few days and ate the buffalo meat. He allowed his body to heal and he gained back some of his strength. He went on the move once again and he was able to travel even faster now. When he finally reached the Missouri River, he either built a small raft or got a small boat from friendly Dakota Indians. This is debated. He floated down the Missouri River to Fort Kiowa. In mid-October, he reached the fort and limped inside. The bear attack happened in early September. Hugh Glass had covered 250 miles after being shot in the leg. Then the grizzly attack had broken his leg, punctured his neck, ripped his scalp, lacerated his back so badly that you could see his ribs. Glass instantly became a legend. Word spread, but Glass was not finished. He seeked revenge on the two cowards that had left him to die. Glass had been at the fort for a few days recuperating when he learned about a plan to send some of the fur traders to a Mandan village 300 miles upriver to trade with the Native Americans. Glass jumped at the chance to join the five men that were to make the journey. Glass needed a rifle, gunpowder, and shot. He knew he could get a rifle there on credit since he was one of Ashley's men. Glass also expected to find Bridger and Fitzgerald at Henry's Fort, so he was desperate to get upriver as soon as he possibly could. The boat set off in mid-October, just a few days after Glass had arrived at the fort. They traveled upriver for six weeks, fighting the currents and the strong winds. The boat was within a day's travel of the village. This last section of the river was a huge, large bend known as an oxbow. Glass asked to be dropped off on shore. He thought he could walk the distance overland quicker than the boat could reach the village, and any time saved would make it quicker for him to reach his vengeance. This decision ultimately saved Glass's life. After a short time that Glass left the boat, a group of re-Indians attacked, killing every man aboard the boat. Two Mandan Indians witnessed these events, jumped on their horses, and they got to Glass before the Re could. The two friendly Indians took Glass to Tilton's Post, a trading post near their Indian village, run by the Columbia Fur Company. Glass learned about the massacre on the boat that he was just on a short time ago. He had cheated death once again. Glass had been involved in three Indian attacks now, which killed a total of 21 men and wounding 16, as well as being mauled by a grizzly bear and left to die. Glass departed Tilton's post that night. After the grizzly attack, Andrew Henry and his men had reached the fort in late October. Henry decided to relocate further south to the Bighorn River Valley. A second Fort Henry was built near the junction of the Little Bighorn and Bighorn Rivers, about 30 miles south of the larger river's junction with the Yellowstone River. It took Glass 38 days to walk from Tilton's Post to Fort Henry, but when he arrived, he found an empty fort. There are no records to indicate how Glass knew that he needed to head for the Bighorn River, but historians suspect that a note was left at the fort telling about the second location. It is believed that Hugh Glass walked into the new fort on New Year's Eve, 1823. Just a note, it is shortly after New Year's, so this is basically exactly 200 years ago that this event happened. It is noted that the men in the fort were completely shocked after seeing the man they all believed was dead walk through the front gate. Glass answered everyone's questions, but when he finally had a chance to ask a question, he only had one question in mind. Where are Fitzgerald and Bridger? Glass was told that Fitzgerald had already left, and only Bridger was left in the fort. Glass had started this journey in order to seek vengeance on the two men, but when he finally confronted the 19-year-old, he decided to forgive the young man. He believed that Fitzgerald was the real culprit. He only wanted his gun back, but Fitzgerald was the one who had it. 
Fitzgerald had already left for Fort Atkinson. Glass was stuck at the new Fort Henry for nearly two months. The weather had been extreme, strong winds and strong snow. Glass waited for a chance to make it to Fort Atkinson to confront Fitzgerald. Andrew Henry needed to inform his partner, William Ashley, about their current situation and the plans for the upcoming spring fur trapping season. He believed the best way to do this was to have a dispatch delivered to Fort Atkinson. Then it could be forwarded to Ashley in St. Louis. Due to the danger of the hostile Indians and the weather, Henry wanted five men to accomplish this mission, and he offered extra pay to any man that would take on this task. Hugh Glass, of course, jumped at the chance to make it to Fort Atkinson. He seized the opportunity since Fitzgerald was at the fort. So Glass, Marsh, Chapman, Moore, and Dutton left the fort on February 29, 1824. The men left on the Bighorn River. They took an overland route southeast across the Tongue River to the Powder River. They headed south until the Powder split. Following the South Fork, they continued to the North Platte River. At this point, the spring thaw caused the river to flow again. The ice broke up and they built boats out of buffalo hides and continued. After a while, in their makeshift boats, the men saw an Indian chief on the bank speaking the Pawnee language, calling them over. The men believed he was a friendly Pawnee Indian. They pulled over and left Dutton with the boat and the rifles. Glass, Marsh, Chapman, and Moore followed the chief towards the village. Following the Indian chief, Glass overheard the Indian speak in the Ree language. He warned his companions that this was not a Pawnee village, but a Ree village. The men quickly ran back towards their boat. Moore and Chapman were shot. Glass and Marsh ran towards the hills and hid until nightfall. Dutton set off downstream and eventually found Marsh walking down the river. The two men thought Glass was killed by the Ree and set off again. They reached Fort Atkinson in May without Glass. Yet again, Glass was stranded in the wilderness, three to four hundred miles away from civilization in hostile Indian lands, and he had no rifle. Glass later told a trapper this, Although I had lost my rifle and my plunder, I felt quite rich when I found my knife, flint, and steel in my shot pouch. These little fixins made a man feel right pert when he was 300 or 400 miles from anybody or any place. Glass abandoned the river and headed cross country directly for Fort Kiowa. It was calving season for the buffalo, and he believed that the prairie would be filled with buffalo calves that he could survive on. Once Glass reached Fort Kiowa, he learned that John Fitzgerald had indeed enlisted in the army, and he was absolutely at Fort Atkinson. In June of 1824, Hugh Glass finally reached Fort Atkinson. Revenge was still on his mind. The army had different plans, though. Fitzgerald was now government property. Glass demanded a face-to-face -face meeting with John Fitzgerald. The captain that was on duty listened to Glass's story. He went and got Glass's gun from Fitzgerald and told Glass to forget about Fitzgerald as long as he remained a member of the United States Army. This story is disputed. Some people state that Glass forgave Fitzgerald right then and there the same way that he'd forgiven Bridger. We don't know which story is true, but the Hollywood version of Glass hunting down Fitzgerald in the wilderness and killing him after a lengthy fight scene is far from accurate. All we know is that he forgave Bridger and he didn't kill Fitzgerald. Some stories state that Glass was paid $300 at the fort to compensate him for his need for vengeance or for the hardships that he had to endure. After these events, Glass continued to trap. He moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. He was then transferred to Taos. From there, he went into the Southern Colorado Territory. While he was trapping in Colorado, his group spotted an Indian woman on the bank. She was startled and screamed. 
The warriors heard her screams and fired arrows on the group. One arrow struck Glass in the back. Glass suffered on the 700-mile journey back to Taos with an arrow in his back. A trapper removed the metal arrowhead with a straight razor. After Glass had finally recuperated, he headed to the Yellowstone River country to trap. It is unknown what Glass did during 1829. In 1830, Glass was trapping and hunting in the upper Missouri region. Ledgers state that Hugh Glass traded at Fort Union from 1831 to 1833. In spring of 1833, Hugh Glass, accompanied by Edward Rose and Hillian Menard, left Fort Cass to trap beaver downriver from the fort. The trappers were crossing on the ice on the frozen river. They were ambushed by a large party of Re who were concealed on the opposite side of the bank. All three men were shot, scalped, and robbed. James Beckworth gave an account of Hugh Glass's death, having found the murdered men. We returned together and buried the three men amid the most horrible, terrible scenes that I have ever witnessed. The crying was truly appalling. The three men were well known and highly esteemed by the crows. When their bodies were lowered into the last resting place, numberless fingers were voluntarily chopped off and thrown into the grave. Hair and trinkets of every description were also contributed and the grave was finally filled up. Many people don't believe the Indians actually voluntarily chopped their fingers off to throw in the glass's grave, but everybody was a little upset about it. Some of the Native Americans who killed the three trappers had met a group of trappers led by Johnson Gardner. They were pretending to be a different tribe of Indians and asked to be warmed by the fire. The trappers allowed them. One of the trappers noticed that an Indian had Glass's rifle and some of the other Indians had possessions that belonged to the other murdered trappers. A fight ensued and two of the Indians were captured. Johnson Gardner had the Indians scalped and alive after they could not give a good explanation for having the murdered men's possessions. Hugh Glass led a difficult life. He suffered time and time again after being in a number of different Native American attacks and surviving a brutal grizzly attack and crawling back to civilization. His survival story made him a legend, especially back in his day. And the 2015 movie made his story well known in our time again. And that is Hugh Glass's story of survival. What an incredible story, folks. That is, I just love it. That movie, amazing. Um, of course, it's Hollywood. They're going to throw in all sorts of extra crazy stuff that didn't actually happen just to kind of spice it up. But uh, yeah, it was a very brutal and difficult time. After all this, getting attacked by a grizzly bear. And then all of his friends on the boat get murdered. He, he just it barely escapes and then getting attacked by Indians again so many people back then were just brutally murdered by Indians and we brutally murdered many many Native Americans there was a reason why they ended up being so angry towards us and it wasn't because we were nice and friendly people I'll just put it at that but I actually learned a ton making this video and I hope you did too as always I hope you enjoyed and we will see you on the next Peace.